Good morning. Happy Palm Sunday. Boy, it feels great to worship with you together. Uh, a couple announcements that I want to make about this coming Passion Week. Um, first of all, Good Friday. As we mentioned last week, uh, because we've been planning this out for months, not knowing how the pandemic would play out, not knowing that we could be back meeting together, the way it is because of, of all the skits, uh, the wonderful choral music that's being put together, that's been taped and being spliced together by Neil right now, um, it will all be taped. So we're encouraging you to find a good place at home, get comfortable, have communion ready, as well as, uh, there was the announcement last week, have a small cross, a homemade cross, or whatever works for you to hold as we go through the Good Friday service together. So on Friday, it will be at home, taped, although if you do not have access to the internet, we will have this open here, but it will be just simply watching on the screen above. So you're still welcome to come, but we're expecting a very small group here on the church on Good Friday. For Easter morning, it's all live. Please, we have room. Uh, it's wonderful to see about 60 people here this morning, uh, 50, 60 people. We can have up to 100. So if you're at home and you're saying, you know what, I haven't been to church in, in a very long time, please call the office this week, sign up. We'll be glad to have you here and worship together. Uh, a couple of other things, there will be cinnamon buns. Isn't that great? I was hoping for Pascha, but you know what? Cinnamon buns are a good second. And they'll be setting everything up in, in a safe, COVID-friendly way so that we can fellowship together as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. A couple other quick announcements we have for family business. Uh, we've been talking to seniors from our community and our church about those who need some help with getting their COVID shots. And it might be something as simple as don't have access to the computer to print off the COVID forms. We have them in the back of the church and we've printed them off. If you need help filling out forms or getting a ride down to the convention center, please contact the church. We'd love to help. If you know of other people that need that type of help, again, we at the church, we'd love to be a service for you. Um, and again, we want to encourage you. If you are feeling comfortable, come back, worship with us in live. It is so great to be in community together, to be able to sing, yes, with, with our masks on, but to be able to sing with these people on the stage. That is the thing that I've missed the most during this time of COVID. So let's bow for a word of prayer as we begin this service. Lord, today is the day that you proclaimed yourself the King, the Messiah. Yet it was entirely something different than what the rest of the world expected at that time. They had no idea what was coming this Passion Week. But Lord, you knew. And you went in with your held, head held high because you knew all of human history was coming down to this point. Bless this worship service as we sing praises to you. Bless us as we worship together in spirit here in the building and in our homes. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I like using tools for lots of things. Maybe it's the youth and children's pastor. Maybe it's, you know, just the fact that I'm easily distracted and I need things to help me keep focus. Uh, for the last while, I've been using the five-finger prayer just to help as a reminder for me. I've always appreciated the acronym ACTS when it comes to prayer. So I'd like to actually guide us through that today if that works for you. And if not, I'm up here anyway, so you have no choice in the matter. I'm going to guide us, so I'm going to explain a section of it, and then I'm just going to leave a little bit of quiet where we can pray. pray. So when we think of A in the word Acts, we think of adoration. That's our appreciation and our thanksgiving and our acknowledgement that God's Lord. And not only Lord, but he's Lord of our life. So what is it that we're thankful for God for today? How is it we're adoring him? Let's just spend a couple moments praying. in the word acts has to do with confession 
For me, it's a reminder that every one of us are sinners. None of us are perfect. In fact, we all have failings. So this is a time when I like to ask God to search my heart. What are the things that are wrong between me and him or possibly between me and other people? And as he reminds us of those things, ask for his forgiveness and lift him up. Spend a few minutes praying for that now. The third thing is the T, which is thanksgiving. What are the things we're grateful from God, but also from each other in life in general? What are the things that we're thankful for that he's doing? And lastly is the S, which is supplication, which to me is a really big word to say, ask for things that are in our lives. What are the things we are hoping that God will move on, whether it's, you know, people we know, whether it's situations around us, whatever sorts of things. What are the things we want to ask God for today? And my personal thing is I never ask out of selfishness. I try, you know, if I'm feeling sick, I'll ask for that. But generally, I try to lift up other people rather than make it all about me. God already knows my heart. God, in this space, I'm thankful for these people that I know are watching online right now and those that are alive in this building, that you continue to care for us, God, that you're active, you're actually really active, that you're not just watching from heaven hoping it all works out. Lord, none of this is a surprise to you, so we just pray that you continue to be God, that you work through COVID, you work through vaccines, you work in whatever way you're going to work, and that we put our faith and trust in you. Lord, as we uh, take offering today, Lord, I thank you for the ways that Westwood is continuing to minister to people, uh, whether it's by delivering cinnamon buns and kids packs or whether it's by meeting live in the building. We still have an opportunity to bring your word and your love and your hope to people around us. So I just pray that you use our finances, that you allow us to use them wisely, and that you give us your direction. We ask all this today in your name. Amen. Paul. Monday. The young colt awakes. Her mind is still savoring the afterglow of the most exciting day of her young life. Never before has she felt such a rush of pleasure and pride. She walks into town and says to herself, I'll show myself to them just like I did yesterday. This is going to be good. I'm here. You can throw down your garments for me. But they didn't notice her. They went on drawing the water and paid her no mind. Don't you know who I am? Move along, little colt. Stop making so much noise. <laughs> I will go find a fruit vendor. Surely you will give me the respect I deserve. And an apple, perhaps? Bananas, oranges, apples, all the freshest fruit at the best price. Hi, remember me? Um, bananas, oranges, apples, all the freshest fruit at the best price. Remember me? I want an apple! Get out of here, little colt. Go back to your mother. Bananas, oranges, apples, all the freshest and best price. Mother, yesterday they threw down their garments for me. How come today was different? Oh, foolish. 
first child. Don't you realize that without Jesus, you're just an ordinary donkey? Your worth is in what you carry. Just like the donkey who carried Jesus into Jerusalem, we are most fulfilled when we are in service of Jesus Christ. Without him, all our best efforts are like filthy rags and amount to nothing. When we lift up Christ, however, we are no longer ordinary people, but key players in God's plan to redeem the world. Thank you, guys. You know, so often we're like that young colt after Palm Monday, as the skit was called. We, uh, we get all excited when we're given praise and glory. Look at how great the one who's on our back is. And yet, we don't realize sometimes we, we want the praise for ourselves. I'll talk more about that towards the end of the message. What's the right attitude as we come into Palm Sunday? Because here's the reality. You know, we, we sort of scoff at the Jews 2,000 years ago. How could they miss it so badly? I think we're exactly like them. We still miss it today. Now, I have a, this is the first Palm Sunday message that I'm doing since I'm back in the pulpit after two years of working for Multiply. And something's changed for me since I preached on that last because I had done well over a dozen Palm Sunday sermons before. But let me tell you about the thing that's changed for me, my perspective on the location, the place where that young colt had Jesus on its back right into. In September of 2018, I had the great honor of handing out eyeglasses in the West Bank. In particular, three locations. Rafat, a small village just to the southeast of Jerusalem. Bethlehem, and right in the heart of Jerusalem itself. Actually inside a place called Herod's Gate. The gate that Herod built. There is actually a medical center in there being used to heal people in the name of Jesus. Isn't that incredible? It was truly the most amazing trip that I've done in all my travels so far. At the end of that trip, I spent two days in Jerusalem, two days walking around this most amazing ancient city by myself. Each night, I stayed in a place that Jesus stayed the day before Palm Sunday, and then again that evening. It was in the town of Bethany. Bethany is about five kilometers away from Jerusalem on a location known as the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is now actually the location of a hospital that is run jointly by numerous Christian denominations. It's the hospital where the poorest of the poor from the West Bank and Gaza can get world-class health care for free. Now, to get to Bethany, we had to drive up the most steep, windy road I've ever driven on in my entire life to that point. With the car we rented, um, it was a Chevy Cruze that lost the C. It fell off and it said Ruse. So the Chevy Ruse, that it was supposed to be six cylinders, we're sure only five worked. The maximum we could get going up those steep hills at places was 40 kilometers an hour. And there was one point where the wheels were spinning on the highway as we're trying to climb the hills, coming into Jerusalem from Bethlehem, you know, through the Jordan, and, and up into Jerusalem, up to the Mount of Olives. I didn't know highways could be that steep till that point. And it was hot. Oh, by the way, you know, could you imagine if it's that steep and, and you're skidding on dry pavement, what it would be like if it ever snowed there? Like, it snows extremely rarely in Jerusalem, but, but I just can't even imagine and hot. It was so hot and windy. That day we drove in, it was plus 42 degrees Celsius, and there was a sandstorm coming in from behind us. It was the strangest thing, because you look one direction, it's all clear, and the other direction behind you, you can see the sandstorm rolling in. And within two hours of getting to the Mount of Olives and settling into my room, um, the temperature dropped from being over 40 degrees Celsius to 10 degrees Celsius in two hours. And I was actually cold. For two days in a row, I walked from Bethany to Jerusalem. It was only about five kilometers, but that was truly the steepest road I've ever walked on. It was even steeper than the road from Jericho. Most cars could not drive on it. About halfway between Bethany and Jerusalem is the Garden of Gethsemane. 
so I actually saw it. And I always had this image in mind, the Garden of Gethsemane, as we come to the Passion Week. What comes to your mind as you think of the Garden of Gethsemane? I think of a dark place where Jesus, he, he was just in agony knowing the cross was coming. But it's actually one of the most beautiful places I've ever been to. Um, they even have olive trees that date back to just about the time of Jesus there. Almost 2,000-year-old olive trees. I know that, that just, how long do our trees in the Assiniboine Forest live? <laughs> like, they're almost little toothpick weeds, right? But almost 2,000-year-old trees, trees that were planted 25, 30 years after Jesus was there. And then as you walk out of, of just right past the Garden of Gethsemane, you come to tombs, the largest cemetery I've ever seen in my life. Uh, these the cemetery, the cemetery I, I'm, they said on the plaques that were around that it had grown lots over the last 2,000 years, but it was still very big at the time of Jesus. There were signs where you could only go if you had a guided tour where it said, these tombs are 3,000 years old. Again, that just blows my mind. And as you wind through these tombs, going back to the time of King David, you come to this gate and I've never seen anything like it before. I've never experienced anything like a walled city before and crowded. The days I was there, they told me, oh, the crowds are quite small. You're so fortunate to be here. I have never been in such a crowded place in my entire life. And all the while, I'm thinking about Jesus is riding down this hill past a beautiful garden that he will soon be in agony as he's awaiting his trial and crucifixion, coming up to this city that is just packed because it was full beyond capacity, ready for the Passover. And that is now what I have in mind when we hear this, the story of the Palm Sunday. So Trent, if you could read to us. We're reading from Luke chapter 19. After telling this story, Jesus went on toward Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. As he came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them. As you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. So they went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, Why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply, re simply replied, The Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. He replied, If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. But as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it is too late, and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. Okay. On that first Palm Sunday, Jesus was at the top of the poles. He had just raised Lazarus from the dead. He came into Jerusalem, hailed by the people as the son of David, the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, so many of us, we know this story so well. Because we hear it every year just before Easter. Jesus strolling into Jerusalem on a donkey. It sounds so surreal, so calm, so nice. But that's not actually how the story was. As I said, I, I had no idea how steep it was. That young colt 
had to be surely very firm-footed as it came down those hills. And the shouting and, and the prophecies that were being fulfilled that the people knew were being fulfilled. Now, I want to talk and teach a little bit about prophecy this morning. Because that is a very important concept that we as Christians, we, we say that we believe, but yet we don't have nearly enough deep understanding of what is prophecy. The whole Bible is full of prophecy. When we hear the word prophecy, though, we often think of some wild-haired preacher predicting events way off in the future of doom and gloom. Now, I want to say there is some of that in prophecy, but that's actually a very small part of what prophecy is. I want to tell you it's much more complex than that. By far and away, the most common type of prophecy is telling us this is how we should live now, and if we do so, we will experience God's grace and fullness in our lives, and the consequences will be hard, dire, if we do the opposite. So, so let me explain. Here's what I mean. This is two-thirds of the prophecy in the Old Testament, summed up in Deuteronomy chapter 29. Carefully follow the covenant so that you may prosper in everything you do. You might say, well, how is that prophecy? Let me explain to you how the rest, next two chapters in Deuteronomy chapter 29 and 30 go on. They say things like, listen to your parents and honor them, and you will prosper in the land. Honor your marriage vows, and God will give you success in the land. Be truthful and let your yes be yes. Be people of integrity in court and in the business, and you will be successful in the land. Yes, that, that's actually prophecy. And Moses goes on to explain that if you do these things, you will have peace. What was in the story of the Palm Sunday message we just read? Jesus said, these people don't know the way of peace. What are they looking for? Well, we'll talk more about that in a bit, but in a nutshell, it's kick the Romans out by force. Jesus is saying, we need peace. I have come to give you peace. That's what the prophets were calling for. You might say, well, what do you mean by that's prophetic? Moses and the other prophets afterwards said, if you do these things, you will have long life and peace where you live. You'll have peace within your family. Honor your mother and father. Families that have that honoring have peace in their extended household. Parents, husband and wife, honor each other's vows. You'll have peace in your immediate family. Being honest, people of integrity, you'll have peace within the community around you. Something I've learned in the last few years, talking to, uh, to deve developmental agencies as we're trying to help uh, refugees start businesses so they can get on their own feet. Do you know the number one aspect for having a successful economy in a nation is peace? Now, just stop and think about it. Why do we have the wealth that we have in our country? Because we don't have wars and criminals rampaging through our society. As a matter of fact, we're horrified when we hear of those things, right? Because we have peace. We have peace of saying we will follow the laws of the land. And the prophecies look like this. If you don't follow the laws of the land, there will be no peace. And likewise, you will have anarchy. You will have famine. You will have strife between nations. You might say, well, what? That's prophecy? That's common sense. No, it's not. Stop and think about that for just a minute. Why do we call that common sense? We call it common sense because well, that's what's been taught to us by our parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles before us. And where did they get that from? They ultimately got that from Scripture. So stop and think about it for a minute. How many smart people, people who have high intelligence, don't do those very things? 
people who, who did extremely well in university and, and they're successful in their careers and jobs, yet they're completely unsuccessful in so many other areas of their life. If, if you don't obey your vows, honor them. Think of what the damage that does to your family. This is, this is prophecy. This is what God is saying, I want you to do. Why? Not because you have to do these things in order to be saved. I want you to do these things because I love you so much and I want to protect you. That is two-thirds of the prophecies in the Bible. And that is a good thing. Okay, let me talk about the other third in the Old Testament of prophecies. The other third are about specific events in the future. And there's two categories within that. Over 90% of these prophecies are about events that will happen shortly after the prophecy was made. Okay, a good example of this is in Isaiah chapter 17. Isaiah, the great prophet, perhaps the greatest of the prophets of the Old Testament, the one who predicted more about the coming Messiah than any other prophet, says in Isaiah chapter 17 that the city of Damascus, the capital of Assyria, of Syria, still the capital of Syria to this day, is about to be defeated and its inhabitants are about to be taken into captivity. Now, this is not a prophecy about what was to happen in the year 2012 when there was a civil war that rages and still rages on in Syria 10 plus years later. I actually had a number of people post on my Facebook 10 years ago and say, look, the end times are at hand. And I'm like, yes. We live in the end times, but that's not an example of how the end times are at hand. That's a prophecy that was made 725 years before the birth of Christ about an event that would happen 723 years before the birth of Christ. So so what I mean by this is Isaiah was telling the kingdom of Israel, the city of Damascus, uh, sorry, the, the kingdom of Judah, The kingdom of Damascus is causing you all sorts of strife. But do not worry. They will soon be defeated unexpectedly by a greater power. And God is behind that greater power. Now, at the time, everybody in the area, in the region, would have said, there's no way Damascus is going to fall. It is a superpower. The city is, has not been defeated in battle in over a thousand years at this point in history. Have you seen those walls? There's no way Damascus is going to fall to anybody. And in less than two years, just like Isaiah predicted, the city fell. So that's the other part of prophecy. Prophets saying these things are going to happen, and the vast majority of them happening exactly like they would say within a few short years. Sometimes they might go farther on in a few decades within the lifetime of the person. But That's also the majority of prophecy. So here's the good news. Did you know that the vast majority of the prophecies, over 97% of the prophecies that are made in the Old Testament, have all come true exactly as they predicted? That's actually what gives me hope and trust in the Bible. And that comes to the last form of prophecy. The prophecies on the future off in the distance. So remember Isaiah. The vast majority of Isaiah's prophecies were exactly like what I just said. You know, this event's going to happen, two years later it happens. And everybody's like, whoa, we never saw that coming. And Isaiah's like, God did, because he's in charge. And then Isaiah says things like, and the Messiah is coming someday to set things right. I don't know when. It's way off in the distance. It's like looking from a hill to another hill, and I see part of the image. And how did the people know that they could trust Isaiah's prophecy? Because 90% of the other prophecies that he just gave had come true exactly like that. So now you might say, well, Pastor Greg, how, how, do, I, how do I know which prophecies have come true in, in those books? And that? that's actually the joy of digging into the Scriptures, that's actually one of my joys when people say, how do you enjoy reading, you know, Isaiah and, and Jeremiah? Like when it gives all these prophecies, I, I find it so dry and boring. I have no idea what's going on. My joy in reading those is I've got my computer or my Bible dictionary ready to go. And I'm like, okay, what's that about? And then I look it up in a good commentary and it talks exactly about, oh, and this happened. And you're like, wow, 
That's incredible. That's actually what the people who, when they read these at that time, would have been saying, wow, that's incredible. Which goes to the point of, this is why we can trust the prophecies of the coming Messiah in the future. Because they said these things exactly. And this is exactly what happened in the life of Jesus. He fulfilled the prophecies of Isaiah, Micah, Zechariah, Daniel, and many others all about the distant coming Messiah. This week's prediction, the one that's being fulfilled with Palm Sunday, is about what the prophet Zechariah predicted, that the Messiah would ride into Jerusalem on a young colt. Here's the background. Most conquering kings would ride into a city on a war horse, but not Jesus, not the Messiah. Why? The young colt showed I'm coming in to bring peace. And the Jews all knew what this prophecy meant. But even then, they misunderstood it. Why? Why would they misunderstand that? Because of, again, context. The book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is is an amazing book. The first half is actually really easy to read. It's a story that I I hope to preach that in the next few years here. It's It's a great story where... You follow the life of this young man who's 12, 14 years old, Daniel, as he goes off into captivity. And, and he has, goes through all these trials, but God uses him in the most amazing ways. And he's a person of integrity. And it's a great story to, to emulate and say, hey, I want to be like that young man. But the second half of Daniel is all about prophecies of the future. Some of them of, of events that are just, just around the corner and some that are a whole lifetime later, 70, 80 years later. But all of those prophecies in Daniel, 90% plus of them, came true within a generation or two after Daniel. So what were some of them? Well, some of the horrible things that Daniel was saying. There's there's this horrible beast that's coming that's going to desecrate the temple of God. That happened exactly. There's this horrible man named Antiochus Epiphany. That Actually, it's interesting that secular scholars say things like, The book of Daniel, there's no way Daniel could have been written by Daniel himself because he describes the events so clearly that happens that that it had to be written in hindsight in his name, which goes against exactly the opposite of what is prophecy, predicting of the future and it being laid out exactly the way it happened. And let me tell you what happened. Daniel, his prophecies, prepared for the kingdom of God to, to come at hand. So for 500 years after the fall of Jerusalem the first time, the Jews were under the oppression of all these other foreign powers. But just like it was predicted in Daniel, their kingdom for 80 years became their own nation again. Judah was now known on the world stage. And as a matter of fact, they were a small nation that punched far above its weight. The the celebration of Hanukkah is actually recognized in the ancient world as one of the greatest um, unexpected victories. The Jews, outnumbered 10 to 1, defeat an army that's significantly more uh, well-prepared for battle than they are, but their tactics and miraculous interventions saved the day. And for 75, almost 80 years, they punched above their weight, but then the nation fell. It fell to the Romans. Under a guy named Herod, who's king when the Messiah is born. Do you see how these prophecies come together? But the Jews were upset instead. They expected that their kingdom would live on and take over the world. You might say, well, how could a little kingdom take over the world? Well, that's actually what's happened all throughout history over and over again. And they expected it was their turn now. Rome. When we talk about Rome, Rome is an empire, but first it's a city. The little city of Rome. If you go back in history 27, 2800 years ago, Rome was the backwater city on the Italian peninsula. Nobody expected Rome to likewise defeat all the other cities that were much more powerful around them, let alone take over the entire Italian peninsula and then eventually take over the entire area around the Great Lake, the Mediterranean Sea, and treat it like its own lake. 
So they would have looked at Rome and said, look at that little city. It's turned into a city of a million people, and they control the whole world. The most powerful empire in the world at that time. They said, oh yeah, we're going to be even greater than that. That's what they were looking for. But what was Jesus saying? I'm a king of peace. It is important for us to acknowledge that Jesus is king and that he's in charge. We live in a culture and a society where we have the idea of monarchy is exactly opposite of what we want. Or if we do have a monarchy, we want a constitutional monarchy like what we have now. The Queen of England, she makes no real decisions. She has no real power. She is simply a figurehead. The prime minister in the House of Commons is the person with true power. In the ancient world, though, a ruling monarch had, had complete power over life and death, that they were the supreme ruler. With Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, he's claiming to be a king who reigns supreme. And the Jews, even then, wanted to control what did that look like. But that's just like us, isn't it? We want to control what that looks like. I've been talking about this Easter series, this book that Naomi lent me. You know, the whole concept of it is that we just really want Jesus to look like us. Jesus, in my image, is just a lot like Greg Weintz, but a better version. <laughs> what, what idolatry. And if we stop and think about it, I bet you you do the same thing for yourself, don't you? Jesus shouldn't look like us. We should strive to look like him. And look at how he turned things around. We need to accept Jesus as our absolute leader in charge of our lives. We need to accept that without him, we can't come to the Father. We are broken. We are out of relationship. And King Jesus, just like Isaiah predicted, he would come and pay for all of our sins. Terry, we didn't even talk about this. What perfect timing of the Acts prayer, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. I like stuff instead of supplication. We come before and say, God, we have garbage that we have to lay at your feet. And it's not just a tune-up in our lives. We need transformed. And we can't do anything to come to you on our own. That is what Jesus was proclaiming when he came in as Messiah. Let me read to you the conclusion of the skit that we had before. Just like the donkey who carried Jesus into Jerusalem, we were most fulfilled when we are in the service of Jesus Christ. Without him, our best efforts are like filthy rags. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. And amounts to nothing. When we lift up Christ, however, we are no longer ordinary people, but key players in God's plan to redeem the world. When you're a follower of Jesus and you give him lordship of your life, you become a key player in building his kingdom. And when you do that, we get to experience life to the full. Well, what does life to the full mean? Well, it doesn't necessarily mean easy, that's for sure. But it means life the way we were created to be. To transform the world around us and to likewise be transformed ourselves. So this Palm Sunday, have you accepted Jesus as your king? An absolute ruler of your life? who's transforming you? Or are you treating Jesus like a constitutional monarch where we're really in charge and we're really going to tell him what we want him to do? <laughs> we all do it. The Jews 2,000 years ago did it. But I'm so thankful that we live in a place where in hindsight we know exactly who Jesus is. Bow with me for a word of prayer and as I'm praying, I'll invite the worship team to come up. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us your life. Thank you that you showed up that day on Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago 
as a real king with real power over life and death. But your power was the power of peace, not the power to kill, to overthrow. Your power was to transform, to make enemies into family, to turn the world upside down. Lord, I confess that I too often don't let you be king in my life. I try to be king myself. Help us in the areas of our lives that we still stubbornly hold on to. Help us to accept you as king. Amen. Thank you very much for being here again today, whether online or in person. Uh, For those that are in-house, remember to wait for the ushers to dismiss you. Uh, We welcome you to visit safely, of course, uh, preferably moving outside rather than the foyer. It's not bad out there at all today, so enjoy the weather. And if you happen to be uh, watching online, uh, we have a foyer call opening up shortly, and so watch for that as well. Uh, Again, to remind you of some announcements, if you would like some cinnamon buns delivered or come by and pick them up, please let the office know. If you need help with anything involving the vaccines, whether it's filling out paperwork or a ride down or that, feel free to contact us and we'll help you through that. As Naomi mentioned and brought a nice illustration, Good Friday is coming up quickly. Please uh, have a cross ready in whatever form you want that to look like. As we end, uh, end, to end today, let's close in prayer. God, I'm grateful for your presence. I'm grateful for the people here and those that you're keeping safe at home. As we uh, leave this place, help us to continually get to know you better, to worship you more, and to live in the life you have for us. Pray all this in your name. Amen.